Okay. So our Torah portion for this Shabbos is Parashat Bo. <coughs> and uh, um, Bo means uh, enter, go in, uh, go and, uh, um, or actually, I mean, literally it means come. Um, come in to Pharaoh's uh, uh, um, space. And uh, the uh, Torah portion has the last three of the 10 plagues. So uh, it's Arbe, Choshech, and Makat Bechorot. Arbe is the locusts, and then uh, darkness, and then uh, the, the uh, smiting of the firstborn. And of course, that's the final uh, plague that, that uh, um, breaks Pharaoh's uh, resistance to, to God and to letting the, the, uh, the Israelites go. Of course, there's a little bit of a progression with, the, with those last three plagues and with the way Pharaoh deals with it. And then finally, um, after we get the, the uh, well, actually in between the, <coughs> the ninth plague and the 10th plague, because God knows that the 10th plague is gonna work. Um, so before the 10th plague happens, God has to arrange the Exodus because God knows that as soon as this 10th plague is going to happen, then Pharaoh is going to uh, break down and the Egyptians are going to kick you out. So this is now what you have to do. And what we have, uh, Bo starts on page, I just had it, <coughs> page 374. <coughs> In the Eitz Chaim Chumash, it's chapter 10 in Shmot. And starting from chapter 12, what we have is um, extensive discussions about celebrating Passover. And Passover is, uh, in traditional terminology, there's Pesach Mitzrayim and Pesach the Dorot, the Passover celebration or observance in Egypt. <coughs> and the Passover celebration as it's mandated for all future generations. And they are intertwined in the Torah reading itself where um, God uh, starts giving all kinds of instructions um, about uh, preparing for the evening of the Exodus. And as I, we've noted many, many times, the first Passover happens the first Seder, so to speak, to use an anachronistic term, the first Seder happens before we get out of Egypt. You know, when we talk about the Seder as a uh, celebration throughout the generations of our liberation from, from Egypt, the truth of the matter is, is that the first Seder took place before we were officially liberated. It took place that evening and then at midnight, um, that's when the official edict comes through from Pharaoh. Okay, get out of here right away. And we leave in haste, remember? That's a, a famous thing. So, uh, but then God also says, this is what you should do now. And then God says, and this is gonna happen into the future and what you should do and how you're gonna explain it to your children. This is of course the basis of the Seder Haggadah idea of teaching your children. I wrote about it a little bit in the, in the Torah Sparks for this week. So this goes back and forth. And then in the middle of this extensive discussion about Passover, which goes for, for most of two uh, chapters, um, we also get, oh yeah, and by the way, the Israelites left. So uh, the, the Exodus itself, you know, is, is, is a couple of uh, verses at most um, that, that we actually get out. And uh, then the rest of the, uh, Torah portion through the end is again more laws about how to uh, uh, commemorate this uh, uh, event. This Torah portion is the first Torah portion that has real legal material. Up until now, if you, if you follow the traditional <coughs> way of counting the 613 mitzvot, so altogether we've had three mitzvot. Um, because it's all been stories and you know all the wonderful dramas of, of, of the families and so on, and even Moses and so on. So until now, it's all been narrative, 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 narrative. 
And then, according to traditional countings, this parsha has 20 mitzvot. This, this Torah portion has, has all of a sudden a load of, uh, of, of a lot of uh, laws that uh, are taken, uh, take effect, of course. And uh, just to, again, point out, when we count mitzvot, we count mitzvot that continue into the rest of time. So any mitzvot, any laws, rules that were uh, supposed to be followed that night, but then never again, such as painting blood on your, uh, on your uh, doorpost, most of us don't do that anymore, right? We're conservative Jews, so uh, so we don't do that. But uh, um, so that's not counted as a mitzvah. So there's a lot of rules, and then there's at least a tw officially twenty rules that go on into time. So that's the Torah portion, and and the issues that that itself, that kind of structure and that kind of mix, uh, you know, uh, the the issues that are raised by that is also part of this Torah portion. So we we have. All kinds of stuff. Does anybody have a particular thing that they want to focus on? Okay. So by popular demand, um, I'm going to make a suggestion that we look at the plague of darkness. And what I would like to do is first, of course, read the text as we have it in the Parsha. The plague of darkness is the setup, so to speak, the ninth plague, the penultimate plague, the one that's, that, that's uh, you know, right before the awful plague of, of the, uh, the, the, the killing of the firstborn. And um, let's read the, this the description of what this means in, um, in the Parsha. And then I'd like to share with you um, an ancient text um, that can serve as a kind of a an early midrash on uh, on on this uh, uh, you know on this phenomenon. So um, so we're going to start from um, let's start from. Just let's cheat a little bit. Let's start a little bit before, so we get a little bit of a context about the darkness plague. And um, let's start from verse 14. No, let's start from 13. Let's start from 12. Okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm a very tough negotiator. Uh, so uh, that's it, I'm, you know, page 376, chapter 10, verse 12. Somebody going to uh, help us out, please? Ha, ha, ha. All oh, right, man. Alan, thank you. Then the Lord said to Moses, hold Can you on make your hand. that volume a little louder or something? Then the Lord said to Moses, Yeah. Hold out your arm over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat up all the grasses in the land, whatever the hail has left. So... So Moses held out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord drove an east wind over the land all that day and all night. And when the morning came, the east wind had brought the locusts. Locusts invaded all the land of Egypt and settled within all the territory of Egypt in a thick mass. Never before had there been so many, nor will there ever be so many again. They hid all the land from view, and the land was darkened. And they ate up all the grasses of the field and all, of, all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, so that nothing green was left of tree or grass of the field in all the land of Egypt. So just briefly, let's, let's pay attention to this. What do we, what do we see from this, uh, from this text about the description of the plague? The coming of the plague, the, the result of the plague, the effect. So I thought it was interesting that darkness is alluded to here as well. Right. So we talk about the land being dark, though. Right, right. So, so this is, you know, again, almost like a little bit of a, a foretasting of the next plague. Um, that that the uh, the locusts create the the swarm is so dark. Um, it's this dark cloud of of uh, of, of these insects, um, and uh, bring and they bring about 
darkness. So then when we get to the darkness, we'll be able to compare the two darknesses. Um, anything else? We can recall if, if, we, if we can from last week that there's a kind of a structure we talked about the, of, of three sets of plagues three times. And uh, that you know each of the three uh, triplets works in a kind of a, an intensification model and also an, a, a model of getting closer physically to human experience, right? So uh, um, um, you know, the locusts are bringing, uh, bringing darkness. They are a follow-up of the hail. And the hail is, is banging against the earth and destroying the crops and so on. But it's basically crushing the crops and you can still see the crops. Now the locusts are decimating the crops. They're eating everything, right? So, it, so it's worse, right? It's, it's a plague against the land um, in, in, in a much more severe way where there's nothing to salvage. There's, there's nothing there, right? They, they just completely, um, they ate up, what does it say here? They ate up all the grasses of the field, all the fruit of the trees, which the hail had left, right? Nothing green was left of tree or grass, field in all the land of Egypt. So even if you don't think about the, the darkness, there's a desolation here. There's a, you know, a washing away of all the coloration of vegetation of life um, by, by this plague. I'm also thinking that, you know, when, um, when Joseph um, came and he um, interpreted Pharaoh's, that Pharaoh's dreams, and then he, you know, was put in charge of managing the food supply for the Egyptians so that they, in fact, didn't starve. And this seems sort of, you know, so here now we have with the um, sort of expelling and you know, ill treatment of the Israelites that the, the plenty is sort of leaving, has left Egypt. So it seems very fitting. Good. And um, I just want to also point out that we have here, which we don't have in, in, uh, in, in many of the other plagues, um, a kind of a naturalistic explanation for how the plague develops, right? When we have, uh, you know, we, we, we have so many, uh, uh, theories that people like to uh, develop to, you know, to explain these plagues. How did, these are obviously not miracles. So the blood that the Nile uh, is turned into, they, they, you know, it's some kind of red algae that happened because of something that happened with the weather and with the flooding and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we make up all kinds of naturalistic, um, you know, backstories for the plagues. Here, I mean, and the Torah says, no, you know, the, the Aaron waved his, uh, his, his rod, his staff out into the air and poof, you know, the water turned into blood. Here, there's wind, right? There's wind that's blowing these, these uh, uh, insects um, more and more as they invade uh, the land. So, the, 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 the plague is not just the presence of these uh, um, locusts, it's, the, it's this whooshing, um, you know, like if anybody remembers the, uh, the Hitchcock, the birds, right? It's like, uh, you no, know, it's like, so, so it, it's not just the, the, the locusts which are creepy enough, but you get this, this whole natural upheaval um, of, of the wind bringing the plague to you. So uh, you first see it, there's a kind of a, which is the way a lot of times, you know, let's say that in thriller stuff, you see the danger approaching and you get more and more afraid and then boom, and then, and then the danger hits and blackout, right? So uh, you're, you're watching this oncoming uh, disaster, and you're feeling it coming closer, and then it finally comes and takes over. Alan, is there somewhat of um, um, a promise not to do this again? Not, later, not a promise, God says, later, God says that whatever I did to Egypt, I won't do to you. 
if you if you stick by me. Right, but here it also says that um, he says right. It says it'll never happen as bad as this again. Nor will there ever be so many again. In other right. words, right. And I think that that actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, that actually happens earlier also. In a couple of the other plagues, it says I think it says that. But I, right now I can't. Um, you know, I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to find it. And I'm not going to look for it. Um, but yes, right. That's a that's an important point, right? This is something that's sui generis. This is this is unrepeatable, right? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Pharaoh hurriedly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, "I stand guilty before the Lord your God and before you. Forgive my offense just this once, and plead with the Lord your God that He but remove this death from me." So he okay, left so Pharaoh. Wait, 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 wait. Good. So, so here's Pharaoh's reaction. And let's take a look just for a half a second, because this I vaguely do remember. Um, Last week. Yeah, last week. What can I tell you? It's a miracle that I can remember anything from last week, but I do remember a little bit from last Adonai week. Hatzadik vaniva miharashayim. Yes, thank you. Where is that? I don't know. <laughs> it's last week somewhere. <laughs> That's yeah. right. So, so he, so, so, da, 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 da. Um, Da, da, da. On page 367. Yeah, that could be where we have is. Pharaoh yes, sent for exactly. Moses and Aaron. Right. Yes. So let's read 2728. Um, and then let's go back and look at it in comparison to 16 and 17. 27 and 28 on page 367. This is chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Thereupon Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I stand guilty this time. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord that God, plead with the Lord that there may be an end of God's thunder and of hell, and I will let you go. You need you need stay no longer. Okay, good. Now let's go to our Torah portion, 1617, page 376, chapter 10. Pharaoh hurriedly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I stand guilty before the Lord your God and before you. Forgive my offense just this once and plead with the Lord your God that he but remove this death from me. Okay, so how do we, uh, um, let's make the comparisons. One of them you did by reading it with that kind of emphasis, the difference of the hurriedly, right? In the first one, he calls him. In the second one, he's in a rush. He rushes to call him, right? So we get, you know, we're like, you know, a, a one more step, you know, of intensification. What else? So here, um, previously, it was um, that I and my people are in the wrong. Here, it's um, I stand guilty. Just you know, um, so it's just Pharaoh is just saying he. And I stand guilty before the Lord and before you. Right, and, that, and there's that too. he adds that. So he takes away his, the people part, the national part. And, but he also now adds, I have been uh, sinning against you, Moses, Aaron, right? Or is it you, um, the people of Israel? No, because then he also says, what's the extra piece that he says? Sana chatati achapam. Forgive my, please, forgive my sin just this one time, right? Forgive me. So he doesn't say, let God forgive me. He says, you, please, accept my apology, right? So um, do we, do we want to uh, offer any comments on that, explain those kinds of little differences, little subtle differences? Well, both times he may, he, you know, the, the, it, with the... Um... The previous one we have that he's just asking for it to end, period. Um, here, this asking for forgiveness, um, but directing it, of course, at Moses so that Moses will ask God, um, almost like Moses would ask it on Moses' behalf as instead of on Pharaoh's behalf. Um, I mean, I think, he didn't, yeah. yeah. But, he just didn't, he didn't ask to be forgiven before, right. yeah. I think that we need to see that there are changes 
but it doesn't have to be in a linear logical progression. What's going on in, Mo, in, in Pharaoh's mind, how he's working, how he's processing what's going on, doesn't necessarily have to work in that kind of straight, straightforward way. Um, he's giving in more and more and more and more because he still wants to resist, right? And, yeah. he, and he will continue to resist. So on the one hand, he's, one, he's giving in. On the other hand, he's also trying to still prop up himself or try to find some other way of establishing uh, a, a means of, of uh, getting, getting his, his way, getting away with his way. And I, and I just think it's very, it's, it's, it's intriguing. I don't wanna make too much of it, but yes, he's, he's not blaming his people anymore. And after all, we remember that back in the last week's Parsha, his courtiers said, cut it out already. Enough, give in. You're just causing a lot of pain and suffering to your own people. So um, there's a certain honesty in him saying, I can't blame my people anymore. This is, it's really all on me. And in a certain sense, then I would read it as a kind of a deflection. You may have to pray to your God, but, but I want to deal with this between you and me. You know, I really, I don't want to recognize <laughs> God if I don't have to, or as much as I might have to. So let's make this between you and me, right? He's also not promising anything. So in the previous, for the previous play, he said, um, I'll let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. He's not even promising that here, but he's instead sort of trying to insinu insinuate himself into a relationship with Moses. Right. right. That, you know, yeah. Hey, after all, you know, we, we're worthy adversaries. You know, we've been working, we've been working across the aisle and, you know, for, you know, each of us. So, uh, you know, let's, let's work on this together. Um, and in, in the second one, he doesn't, he doesn't say, he only asks us for forgiveness. He doesn't offer anything that he'll let the people go. Right, right. Sarita was saying that also. Oh, I'm right. sorry. He make, yeah, no, no. But that's, it's really noteworthy. He's not making any problem. He says, just get this off me. Get this death out of here. Please, you know, come on. We know each other now for a while. So even if we disagree, let's disagree amicably. You know, uh, um, so do that for me. Um, it's, it's just one last uh, point. It's uh, also intriguing to me that the word that is used here for pleading is ha-tiru. Right? We encountered that word all the way back with Isaac. When Isaac prays for a child, Rebecca is uh, um, barren. And it says that, that he prayed and prayed, the word lahatir um, is, is, to, is to like really, really pray and pray some more and pray some more. Um, and, and here, um, and it's, this is not the first time we have it. Pharaoh has asked in the previous, in fact, right, where we were, where, um, where does it say here? Right, Hatir, verse 28 in the previous Torah portion. It's a couple of times. But, but Pharaoh is using this very, very full word about prayer. Um, and uh, um, he's asking uh, Moses to do that. Okay, so let's, let's just now, let's get to, to the Choshech already. Come on. 18. So he left Pharaoh's presence and pleaded with the Lord. The Lord caused a shift to a the Lord caused a shift to a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and hurled them into the Sea of Reeds. Not a single locust remained in all of the territory of Egypt. But the Lord stiffened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. Okay, now here we go. Then the Lord said to Moses, hold out your arm toward the sky, that there may be a darkness upon the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be touched. So Moses held out his arm to, toward the sky and thick darkness descended upon all the land of Egypt for three days. People could not see one another and for three days, no one could get up from where he was. But all the Israelites enjoyed light in their dwellings. Okay. So, and then uh, Pharaoh says, come on, help me out here. Go, go. You know, and Sarah then summoned, summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Only your good. flocks and your herds will be left behind. Even your children. Yes, 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 yes. We know that part. You know, the ending is we actually get out. Um, so let's just now use the time that we have to focus on this, on this uh, darkness. So the darkness was already forecast earlier. The darkness of the, of the locusts. 
So, but here we've got a plague devoted to darkness. And if we think about this um, structure of the plagues, this should be understood as the most intensely terrible plague that we you know, have ever had. Does that work for us? Yeah. Why? Explain more. If you see it as an internal darkness, if you see it as a spiritual darkness, if you see it as a deep depression where people can't see one another, then it's hitting very close to home. So you want to make it an interior, internal experience. Yeah. Uh, I see it, it as I you... see it as external, um, you know, and it's palpable. I mean, um, it's it there's there's a heavy you know this 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 darkness that you can touch this this heaviness. So of course you can't see, but it also when things are that dark and you can feel a set of pressing in on you. And I'm sure it does have a psychological. I mean, people would probably get depressed from it, but I think that this is. This is just, a, it, it's so permeating, it's so heavy. You know, it's, it's like a weight on you, a weight on your chest, right? You, uh, you know, I, I can see that you, you can touch it, you can feel it, you wouldn't be able to breathe. Yeah. It can also be a societal darkness. It can be, you know, a, just a loss of morale throughout, throughout Egypt. So who's, who, where does it come from? It comes from, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the loss of national pride. But what what is the plague then? See, that's where I think it, I think I think that you. you but they're both, broken right? down, broken down from all the other plagues, perhaps. Ah, and so that would, that, power. Would, that would that would see that would see this plague as just the result of the other eight plagues, right? The result of the other eight plagues is a complete a complete collapse of spirit. Of, of, as you say, as more of morale and so on. Um, Sarita's insisting, no, but there's, there's also something tangible that has to be part here. And that, of course, I think that the text is trying to put that forward when it says, by Yamesh Choshech, right? And the darkness was palpable, right? Which is, which is, and then when it says nobody could get up from from themselves for three days. So yes, of course, that could be psychologically for sure. But I think that it's trying to use this kind of physical thing. But at the other hand, what's the difference between the darkness of the locusts and the darkness of, of, of the darkness plague is we don't have that palpable agent of darkness. This is not, you know, the natural, oh, it was an eclipse. Oh, it was a blah, 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 right? Um, to explain, there's no wind that brings the darkness or something like that. The darkness all just happens, right? There is no physical agent that we can point to that is causing the darkness. As far as we're concerned, darkness is just absence of light. Yeah, <coughs> Alan. It's as if they're being plucked from, um, from the earth as we know it. In other words, if you go all the way back, there was darkness that hovered over the earth and then God gave light to separate between the, the, the darkness and the light and the, the Jews had light the Jews had a light that was so they had that ability to have the separation between the darkness and the light the Egyptians did not and so it was again the, the, the real terror was that there was if they were, they were being plucked out of everything they knew that, 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 was, that was around them that, that, that allowed them to exist right Every, no one could see their friend or neighbor plus no zoom you know I, the other difference no from zoom. another difference from the earlier plagues is that there's no destruction here it gets dark everyone sits around for three days waits for the electricity to come back on <clears throat> but you know but then at the end of three days it's just as it was before right but they didn't, but they didn't know that there was going to be three days Right, they didn't, they, there was no, this is no forewarning. But it's they also weren't aware of things. any destruction going on. They, they didn't know what was going they on. Know. You well, they wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. They, they didn't hear fire and, and thunder and, and so on and so forth. Um, did they eat and drink? You know, did they, when it says they couldn't get up, were they really absolutely stuck in their chairs? Does it mean they couldn't get out of their house, but they walked around their house? 
Um, it, you know, it's not clear. I think that, you know, but that's the point. There is this kind of like twilight zone -y quality here of tangible and intangible, right? It's, 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 it's weird because it's, it's, um, it's, not, it's not one or the other. There's a tangibility to the intangibility. There's an intangibility to the tangible experience, the undeniable experience that these people are having. So with your permission, I'm gonna now hopefully share my screen and bring in a text. This is a text, it's called Wisdom of Solomon. It's a, an old book that was written um, in probably somewhere in the first century BCE. And uh, it it's calls itself the Wisdom of Solomon. It's a wisdom book, a, you know, a book of, of advice and, and uh, lessons that we should learn. Um, and, it, and it attributes itself to, Mo, to, to Solomon, who is the wisest of all people and who you know, prayed uh, for wisdom from God. And this is his thing. And, and part of the, of the book is its description of what was going on with these plagues about how God took care of the Israelites versus how God took care of their oppressors and with a strong sense of poetic justice that whatever was visited on the Egyptians and other opponents um, of, of Israel um, is what they deserved because of the way they behaved. So we're gonna skip a lot of stuff. They talk about some of the other plagues too. And I just wanted to focus on the darkness plague itself. So, hold on a second. I'm gonna close this. I gotta do a second here. I thought I had this here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now let me see if I can do this. Yes. Okay, so here's the wisdom is of Solomon. And as it says in this thing, this is actually part of what's called the Apocrypha, which means books that are accepted as holy scripture by certain communities, but not by others. So the Jews do not accept this as part of the Tanakh, but it is included in, uh, as it says here, um, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox uh, churches, they have it in their Bible. So now we're gonna go to chapter 17. And it's a little bit poetic, so we have to read it with a little bit of attention to there. Can you see it all? No. no. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Alan, it's all yours today. Chapter 17. For your judgments are great and hard to interpret. Therefore, undisciplined souls went astray. For when lawless men had supposed that they held a holy nation in their power. That means the Egyptians. They, prisoners of darkness and bound in the fetters of a long night, kept close beneath their roofs, lay exiled from the eternal providence. So I, what, what are we uh, uh, making of this? This is, like I said, poetic kind of language. Um, prisoners of darkness, bound in the fetters of a long night, right? kept close beneath their roofs exiled from the eternal providence. Um, are we talking about the plague or are we talking about something more constant in their own being and their own way of, of uh, relating to God? Um, you know, it could be one or the other. Let's continue. For while they thought that they were unseen in their secret sins, they were divided from one another by a dark curtain of forgetfulness stricken with terrible awe and very troubled by apparitions. For neither did the dark recesses that held them guard them from fears, but terrifying sounds rang around them 
and dismal phantoms appeared with unsmiling faces, and no power of fire prevailed to give light, neither were, there, were the brightest flames of the stars strong enough to illuminate that gloomy night, but only the glimmering of self-kindled fire appeared to them full of fear. In terror, they considered the things which they saw to be worse than the sight on which they could not gaze. The mockeries of their magic arts were powerless now, and the shameful rebuke of their boasted understanding. For those who promised to drive away terrors and disorders from a sick soul, these were sick with a ludicrous fearfulness. For even if no troubling thing frightened them, yet scared with the creeping of vermin and hissing of serpents, they perished temp trembling in fear, refusing even to look at the air, which could not be escaped on any side. For wickedness, condemned by witness within, is a coward thing. And being pressed hard by conscience always has added forecasts of the worst. For fear is nothing else but a surrender of the help which, re which reasons offer, which reason offer, offer offers. Yeah. And from within the expectation of being less prefers ignorance of the cause that brings the torment. Okay, so let's that, stop here because there's a lot here. And frankly, I think it's uh, quite uh, uh, germane to uh, our own uh, um, circumstances these days. There's a lot of philosophizing, a lot of a lot of attempts at being, you know, at offering some wisdom. So back to the uh, our own little discussion: palpable, not palpable, internal, material, and external. Um, what's the what's the kind of description here that that is that is being offered in this flowery language? What's happening during these three days? What is actually happening to a person who's experiencing this? They're being, a, um, yeah, go one ahead. Is, one is um, being the feeling that gets engendered. I mean, of 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 helplessness, powerlessness, and then the fears. Um, and it seems like they're uh, talking about. Um, you know, after all the things and all the other plagues that they witnessed, almost like reliving that and thinking that, you know, here you are, you can't see, and like maybe those locusts are gonna come at you again, you know, almost like like really being afraid, like compounding it, yeah. It becomes one long nightmare, yeah. this whole experience. And the, the beginning says, why is this appropriate? You thought you were so powerful that you could subjugate another people Let's see how you like it if you're totally powerless. And the powerlessness is this experience, which then engenders the main thing that we have here is fear. Right? Um, I, I think it's really an, an interesting uh, uh, statement. For fear is nothing, verse 12, for fear is nothing else but a surrender of the help which reason offers. Right? Reason is offering you help and you don't want it, right? You say, no, thank you, right? And as a result, all you do is immure yourself in more and more fear and you create um, the monsters. There's a, uh, uh, um, a series of etchings that Goya, the Spanish artist uh, created. And uh, um, it, it's called the sleep of reason uh, brings monsters or something. I forget what the, what the last phrase is, but you know, engenders monsters. The sleep of reason brings forth monsters. And, and here we have, this is like 1800 years before Goya. Um, they were powerless, right? And everything that uh, they experienced was this sense of completely abject powerlessness. Um, when you think about some of the terrible things that we have heard of, of the way people get thrown into isolation, into, into, into solitary confinement and, uh, and have nothing to look at, nothing, they can't move, they can't, uh, um, you know, they're at the mercy of some external jailer. That's what's going on here. And then you're at the mercy of your own internal demons. So the internal is definitely here, very, very strong, right? Mm -hmm. um, verse 16. Yeah, let's let's start from there again. Right here. Yeah, I just gotta move. So then, whoever it may, 
So then whoever it might be, sinking down in his place was kept captive, was kept captive, shut up in that prison, which was not barred with iron. For whether he was a farmer or a shepherd or a laborer whose toils were in the wilderness, he was overtaken and endured that in, in, inescapable sentence, for they were all bound with one chain of darkness. Whether there was whistling word, winds or m melodious sound of birds among the spreading branches or a measured fall of water running violently or a harsh crashing of rocks hurled down or the swift course of animals bounding along on the unseen or the voice of wild beasts harshly roaring or an echo rebounding from the hollows of the mountain all these things paralyze them with terror. So what's, what's paralyzing them with terror? What are some of the things, what are some of the sounds that, that terrorize them? It's interesting because it's everything. I mean, you wouldn't think the melodious sounds of birds. You right. know, but I think when you hear things and you can't place them, right? You hear something and you're not sure what the sound is. Um, that's, that, that can be very disorienting and also very frightening. So here, all these things which are kind of natural phenomena, you know, when you can't see and you're so disoriented, then it's like another sense, right? It's just another, you know, you can't see and then you're being bombarded with sound that right. you can't process. Yeah. Every, every, every phenomenon here including the most innocuous or even pleasant is, is terrifying, right? The entire world is terrifying. So the darkness is a darkness of also a certain detached relationship to the world. The world is so alien, the world is so other that everything about it is threatening even though you and I know that, that the birds are singing, it's very nice, you should enjoy it. No, but it, 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 none of this is, is within the ken of the person who is experiencing this when they're in this state of, of, of darkness, psychologically, physically, the whole, they are completely um, divorced from being able to take anything in from the world uh, without fear. You know, when, when, when I hear this poetry, I get, I have a vision of being caught in the black hole, mm. you know, where there is just this heavy weight, you know, bearing down on you. There is no escape from it. Light doesn't escape from it. Uh, you, you have a, a sense that something may be going on outside, but you are very much locked in this. Right. And you're, and you're sucked into that heavy yeah. nothingness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, mean, I think it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable text. But you're sucked into the, to this heaviness, but you're still aware that stuff is going on around you that you can't, you can't experience, I, I, you can't. Well, you can't the, the, awareness, the awareness is being described. The awareness that we are still holding on to is the awareness of the narrator. But the, but the person who's experiencing it doesn't have this poetic way of, of, of uh, talking about their own terror. Right. They are simply going crazy. It's this wise, you know, uh, uh, speaker who is calmly describing, this is what it's like to lose your mind. This is what it's like to be overcome by total fear, right? For the whole world, 20. For the, for the whole world was illuminated with clear light and was occupied with unhindered works. While o over them alone was spread a heavy night an image of the darkness that should afterward receive them. But to themselves, they were heavier than darkness. Right, so this is of course the, the, the prediction, this is what you're in for because you've been so evil. Okay, the rest, the world was just going about its normal business. That's why, as we have in the next one, for your holy ones, there was great light. Well, the, the, the rest of the world, you know, was, was just going about whatever the world was doing. The birds were chirping. The, the water was flowing, some places were loud, some places were quiet, but for them, this was all completely, you know, transfigured. We'll go a little bit more. But for your holy ones, there was great light. Their enemies hearing their voice, but not seeing their form, counted it a happy thing that they too had suffered. Uh, for... So they imagined that this was the case for everyone. 
So they were taking a little bit of pleasure. If I'm going crazy, at least everybody's going crazy. If I'm suffering, at least those Hebrews are also suffering. They imagined. Yet for that, they do not hurt them. The wrong by them, before, the, wrong be, the, the wrong by them before, they are thankful. And because they had been at variance with them, they begged for pardon. Therefore, you provided a burning pillar of fire to be, to be a guide for your people's unknown journey and a harmless sun for the, their glorious exile. For Egyptians well deserve to be deprived of light and imprisoned by darkness. They who had imprisoned your children, through whom the, encourage, the corruptible light of the laws was to be given to the race of men. And now, so that's the coda for, for the, um, the, the difference between the Israelites and the Egyptians. That, uh, you know, it's a little unclear to me what, what uh, some of that is about, about the, the verse two. Um, I could see if I could look up some kind of commentary. I'm not quite sure what that is. But the, then the idea is once we get out, we are always accompanied by light, right? We are even in the darkest of night um, in our unknown journey, we'll be, we'll be uh, uh, always with God's uh, presence, but the Egyptians, of course, not. Um, and now the last plague, since it's in this Torah reading anyway. Go ahead, we got a couple of minutes. After they had taken counsel to kill the babes of the holy ones, and when a single child had been abandoned and saved to convict them of their sin, you took away from them the multitude of children and destroyed all their army together in a mighty flood. Our fathers were made aware of that night beforehand, that by having sure knowledge, they might be cheered by the oaths which they had trusted. Salvation of the righteous and destruction of the enemies was expected by your people. For as you took vengeance on the adversaries, by the same means, calling us to yourself, you glorified us. For holy children of God, of good men, offered sacrifice in secret, and with one count, one consent, they agreed to the covenant of the divine law. Right, this is the first Pesach. That that they would partake alike in the, in the same good things and the same perils. The fathers already leading the sacred thing, sacred songs of praise. So this is an image of everybody singing at the seder, and of uh, sharing the food. The paschal lamb is to be eaten in a group. You invite people to come to your seder. Everybody gets a bite. We're all sharing together. We've been through all of the slavery together. Now we're going to be part of the uh, of the uh, redemption together. So this is this wonderful sense of of community. And, and good and 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 well-being but but the discordant cry of the enemies echoed back and a pitiful voice of lamentation for children was spread abroad both servant and master were punished with the same just doom and the commoner suffering the same as king just as it yeah. says in, in the top in the parsha the parsha says that that the firstborn will die it doesn't matter if you're the king or if you're a, a maidservant Yes, they all together under one form of death had corpses without number. For the living were not sufficient even to bury them, since at a single stroke, their most cherished offspring were, was consumed. For while they were disbelieving all things by reason of the enchantments, upon the destruction of the firstborn, they confessed the people to be God's children. For while peaceful silence wrapped all things and night in her own swiftness was half spent, your all-powerful word leaped from heaven, from the royal throne. Right at midnight, when the night was half spent. A stern warrior into the midst of the doomed land, bearing a sharp sword, your authentic commandment, and standing, it filled all things with death. And while it touched the heaven, it stood upon the earth. What image does that come from? Jacob's ladder. Right, except here. Uh, the it image touched the heaven and stood upon earth, yeah. Right. Then immediately apparitions and dreams terribly troubled them, and unexpected fears came upon them. And each, one thrown here, half dead, another there, made known why he was dying. For the dreams disturbing them forewarned them of this, that they might not perish without knowing why they were afflicted. Okay, so they're again, they're, being, they're in anguish. They don't know why this is happening. Why is there death all around them? 
this is affecting their, their psychology as well. Let's go just a little bit more. The experience of death also touched the righteous, and a multitude were destroyed in the wilderness. But the wrath didn't last long, for a blameless man hurried to be their champion, bringing the weapon of his own ministry, prayer, and the atoning sacrifice of incense. Okay, was... we're going to stop there. This is already, that's the difference, the difference of the plagues that the Egyptians experienced and the, Egypt, and, and the plagues, even when we were punished by God, and this is, of course, part of the whole Wisdom of Solomon text before that, that we haven't looked at, that the, the finality of the punishment for the Egyptians is different than the um, pedagogic uh, ongoing experience of God trying to get us on the straight path, even when we are, even when the righteous, quote unquote, meaning that the, the Israelites experienced a plague of death, we had a leader, Aaron, who could stand in the breach and with his incense, he could stop the plague because he was blameless. He was uh, caring for them. And of course, in, in uh, um, with this, we're gonna stop. One of the star contrasts is Aaron wants to save his people. Pharaoh is not interested in stopping the plague, right? He's just interested in not having any more trouble. All right, that's it for tonight. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad we were able to look at that text. Like I say, I, I think it's a pretty amazing text. And 